are so glad you are here. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> when you are not here, I want to say we truly miss you. So when uh, you get all these great smiling faces at you and big old hugs, it's because we've missed you if you haven't been here. Um, we hope that you got your coffee. We hope you got your donuts and uh, found a great place to sit. One thing I want to do is encourage you, if you are sitting on the end and you feel comfortable enough to scoot in a little bit, um, that would be great for the people who are going to be coming in later, and we know there will be. Um, so just think about that as, you, uh, as we begin to worship. We'd love for you to stand, sing with us. Um, we know that Jesus is the Messiah. His name is above all names. He is powerful. He is uh, just the Almighty God, and we want to give him all of our praise and worship today. Amen. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for
Good morning. Thank you so much for coming today. We're excited you're here. And just as the pastor of the church here, we just want to welcome you to this service. It's always such a wonderful thing to get to meet new people and get to know you and then just talk with friends as they come in the door. So I'm glad you're here. If you uh, are new, there's a connect card that should be in your little packet. Now, I'm supposed to have one of those little packets and show you what it is. If you uh, if you pull that out, we would love to have you. Well, this is not the visitor's packet, but this is what all of y'all get when you come in, except if you're a first time visitor. Uh but that's a good try. Thank you, George. I appreciate the help. Now, there is a Connect card because this is 50% better than I was a minute ago. And you can fill this out. If you're a regular person and got one of these packets, then on the back, put, put any information we need to know and a prayer request. Or, I know this is repetition, but you need to put on there any kind of thing that would help us and encourage us. You know, if you, know, if you think we're doing a good job, say, say it. Let us know. Let's hear from you. If you think we're doing a bad job, well, don't say that. Uh, <laughs> just come talk to me. Okay. But anyway, we'd love to have these. If you drop them in the offering a little later in the service, we'd love it. And if you're a guest, we would like to give you a book. And back on the table here when you leave, Diane, my wife, or, or Don, uh, one of us will be there, and if you're a first-time visitor, we have a free book for you, The Case for Christ, incredible book, and it's free just for coming today. And so uh, I'm glad you're here, and just worship with us. We do about 20 more minutes of worship, and then we go on from there. So just let the Holy Spirit speak to you, let him guide you, let him fill you, and empower you for another week. It's going to be a good day. Oh, 
You opened my eyes to wonders anew. You captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You know, the songs have been written um, over time for uh, generations about the grace of our, of our Lord, the grace of God, and then he sent his son to die for us and the amazing grace that he uh, bestowed upon us. And that's what we want to sing about now. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are. Oh. 
Shout it out to the Lord. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter. to him amen his love for us no matter what happens no matter what we do how many times we fail he loves us unconditionally we cannot find that anywhere else maybe in a dog because they're they love you no matter what right can i tell a quick joke there was a guy had a wife had a dog he wanted to find out who loved him more well, he had to find out, right? So, put them both in the trunk. And he said, the one that's happy to see me when I open the, the trunk, that's the one that loves me the most. <laughs> well, you can imagine who it was. <laughs> Kitty, slugger, everything. It was the dog.
Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, band. Isn't it great that we have a number of bands that can fill in? We're building up uh, two or three different groups that can do worship. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for every person that's here. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come. Rest on every person here. Fill us, Lord, now with your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's have the lights up and welcome to everybody who is here today, and especially you visitors, and we just love having visitors, so um, if you're a first-time visitor, be sure to fill out that Connect card, because we'll be receiving the offering in a minute, and just pop that in there, and if you're a regular, also fill in that Connect card, and put your prayer requests on the back, as Villard was saying, and any good comments, bad comments, you can save for later. 
I uh, just have a few announcements. Um, you notice that we're pretty full. So when you come in, if you're a little bit early, it'd be great if you could scooch to the middle a little bit because sometimes we do have trouble finding the seats for people who are coming in later. So if you want the best seat in the middle, that's where the Holy Spirit is. Come early. <laughs> he is. He's definitely up here. Yeah. And you might see some changes soon to the building next door. We're going to be uh, sort of uh, cleaning up that back area that we still have control of. Um, and uh, that's going to become an area that's being used by some of the youth. And we'll be uh, moving in some, uh, uh, moving some of our stuff to the shed back there and fixing that up. There's going to be a garage sale for the youth, and the more uh, will be coming on that it's, it's sometime in August. And we'll be getting uh, rid of all that stuff that was given for Second Harvest. And so there'll be some changes that you'll see over there. Now, I want to show you a little bit about a chirp church app live. If we can move to this. Are we on there? Some time ago, last year, we, we launched a, an app um, that, uh, there it is, that you can get on your phone and uh, on your iPad. It's called Church App Live, and it's, it's uh, connected to our website. And I just wanted to reintroduce it to you because I've noticed that the usage is dropping. This has a, a, a great number of uses. I mean, um, first of all, on that icon there that says live, you can actually get onto the live services like we're streaming right now. Um, and so that's one way to get onto that. And then the next one over is the archive, and you can get onto the archive services um, that uh, are all there for you to view. Going back to sometime 2013, you can, you can see all of those. Um, and then one of the best uses of this is the church directory. And you can see here different directories. I don't know if anybody wants to be shown on live TV uh, what their address is, but I won't click on anybody. But this is a uh, closed uh, church directory. Um, so people from the web internet, interweb, can't see you. Right? So you have to sign in and log up, log in to that to see it. And if you have trouble getting on or you need to be able to log on, go back there and see Richard afterwards. There's a, a new booth back there called Tech Help. So I know people have been having trouble do that, doing that. So uh, every Sunday now for a while, we're going to have that Tech Help booth. Um, our website's there. You can see news. You can get, log on to the prayer calendar, and there's a prayer calendar where people can pray uh, for different, different items that you log on. At the bottom here, you can even log into whether you're at church or not. And uh, then, there's, then there are daily functions, you know, where you can read the Bible and devotional, and there's a prayer board and different things that we can add on to that. So l I'd like to see the usage of this go up. And every second Sunday uh, of, the, of the month, we're going to have a little demo or a little help on how to set things up and how to get uh, connected in the church. And that tech help booth will be there every second Sunday at least, if not more. So um, Regency next week. We have Regency outreach next week. If you want to, it's about 2 30. It's going to happen at 2 30. So see Michael if you want to get on to the, the Regency team. And then right now we have a little video for you. Uh, about the ladies' retreat, which is coming up in the fall. They came worried and and to begin. Knock on that door so you can get in. And don't mind the time and forget all that's been. Get lost in the park, find a tree that will last. Secret path that leads to a heart. 
Okay. Now I know every one of you ladies was thinking, oh my goodness, I need to go and check my pajamas. Maybe I need a new pair. <laughs> I, would, I would never qualify. I think I have one pair of pajamas. I bought them on Oxford Street in London in 1995 or something like that. And I wear them every night. You probably don't want to see them. <laughs> That's just to get your mind off of your own dilemma with your pajamas. Yeah. Okay, let's say a prayer f and we'll receive the offering. Thank you, Lord for being here with us, and we thank you so much for all that you've provided for us, and we just want to give back with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Gentlemen, you may do your duties. During this time, we've been uh, talking about giving principles, and uh, there are a couple of books at the back, like this, on that pa table back there. These are free. Go back there and pick them up. We've had a lot of testimonials, many testimonials about people whose lives have been changed by these books. So if you haven't picked up one of these books yet, go back there. Also, the people at the information booth back there can help you with that. Last night we had Second Saturday, and it was wonderful. We had a wonderful time visiting the throne room. We were soaking in some wonderful worship music. And if you have never been to one of those Second Saturdays, come. Come to Second Saturday every month. We have it on uh, at 6.30 p.m. on Saturday night. And it was excellent last night. I wanted to mention also our dear friend Will uh, Babin, who passed away Wednesday. And I really miss him already. He used to stand right back there, uh, and he would just watch for anything that needed to be done, and he would do it. And he, he gave selflessly. And Will had a great testimony. He was so certain that he was going to be with the Lord. I talked to him last Sunday, and he was t talking with great anticipation about visiting the throne room of God and seeing some of his relatives that had passed on before him. And the, the, the celebration of his life is going to happen here next Saturday at, at 12 noon. So if you want to come here next Saturday at 12 noon, we're going to be celebrating Will Babin's life. He was a great friend. He is a great friend. And we'll see him again someday. Now we have a clip about the Vineyard Global family, and then Dillard will be coming up. I don't know if you know it, but you're a part of something much bigger than just Wenham. You're a part of a whole vineyard movement that's around the world, about 1,100 different churches, uh, about 600 outside of the United States. They met this week in uh, Columbus and had their national conference. We didn't get to go this year, but uh, they showed this clip there. And it just shows uh, how much the vineyard has spread now. Our conferences have got have become global rather than just uh, 
uh, just United States. And it's kind of exciting when you realize what's happening and to be a part of, of that. So we're glad you're here today to be a part of the local vineyard right here. Let me just give you a few thoughts about today. Number one, you have a very uh, well done piece of paper. It is so uh, well done. Uh, I don't know who did this, but they did a great job. Uh, his initials are VH. But anyway, uh, if you'll take that out, if, if you haven't got one, I've got a few extras uh, that I've lost. Um, and uh, you need one of these today because it's very important. We're going to be uh, we're going to be thinking today. That's unusual. I know we're going to be thinking. And so I want you to think about a brick. I want you to think about 10 different ways you could use a brick. And if you need more room, uh, just start a second column and go to 20. So uh, we need you to think about how many ways to use a brick. That's what you do while I'm preaching. We, we offer things for everybody while I'm preaching. Because I've noticed some of you are downloading apps. Some of you are getting your emails and you're texting. And th I thought maybe we'd just bring you all together and talk about brick. There you go. Then on the back of that is another important part of today. You need to draw a line that touches every one of those dots and never pick up your pen. You've got to draw a, a, a line that touches every one of those dots and you cannot pick up your pen. Okay, you got it? Uh, a brick. And how can I connect all of the dots? I am using a man as a reference. Uh, his name is Mark Batterson. Uh, he wrote a book uh, entitled uh, Grave Robber. I like that book. How many of you today brought, one, uh, brought a friend with you? How many people brought friends with you today? Would, would you come? I want to give you this book. This book, and also I guess I should call you what? Uh, padre. Brother? Pa padre. Padre one one. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. And, and there's the, uh, the success of that. I could have given you a lot better deal on that uh, than he did. We have two or three ministers now in the church that are performing weddings. I'm losing my edge here. Uh, I knew I should go down on my price. Hey, who else brought a friend today? Yes, could, could uh, uh, Robert, you take, oh, take this back to the young lady right there. There she is. Yeah, thank you. Who else brought a friend today? Oops, like the lost that. Oh, yes, take that right back there. Who else brought a friend today? Anybody else that I missed? I, I've got some more in the back. I, I didn't realize how many. Who, who over here? Somebody else brought a friend? Oh, we got a friend. And uh, we're giving these to the people that brought a friend. Okay. Now, if you're a visitor for the first time, go by that table right there. My wife or Don or me or somebody will be there to give you that brand new book uh, uh, that we'd love for you to have. If you're a first time, we want you to get that book right there and take it home. And Huh? Your children are your friends, and you brought them. <laughs> I, he is also an overseer in our church or an elder. What's that? <laughs> yeah, okay. okay I, well, see there, you know, you just wait long enough. People will do anything to get these things. And uh, we also have his little pamphlet. I'm sorry, I missed what you said. My computer died. Uh, I think you need to. Oh, no, that is a serious problem. Dying in that corner right there, there's a, uh, there's a backpack, not the backpack, the other thing. Uh, would you bring that? And I get so excited, I forgot to do what's more very important. That's very important. Okay. But you could pick this up back there. I got so many things to tell you about that I just, uh, uh, this book has just kind of uh, impressed me in an incredible way. It's, uh, if you need to, download that book. I'm sorry I can't buy every one of you one of those books. But you, you ought to think about downloading Grave Robber. I'm using it a lot. You're, I, I was afraid you wouldn't read it necessarily, so I decided I'd download it for you. I mean, I would uh, share some of it with you. And uh, right now you can tell I'm having trouble. I can't think and work and talk at the same time. I, I'm definitely uh, got a single brain or something up there that just doesn't do it. Uh, let me just read you something that's very important to me while my computer's charging enough to come up. If you didn't pick one of these up, you should. There's a few of them back there still. It says, you go nowhere by accident. Did you know that? 
You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God's got a word for you today. I mean, he really does. He wants, to speak. he wants to speak to you. He has a purpose in your being there. Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in grace and love and peace. There's a pastor that wrote this and he for a whole year he read that to his crowd at the end of every service that he had. And the people began to believe that God was leading them. And things began to change. See, God wants us to believe in probably more than we realize. God is, is so powerful. He is so big. He is so great. He is so fantastic. It's impossible to really understand God. Matter of fact, once you become a Christian, I think you enter into this world that you just like, wow, I thought I knew a lot about God. Now I don't feel like I know anything about God because all of a sudden you're experiencing something in your life. We're going to talk about miracles. That's what the book Grave Robber is all about. Let me ask you this question. If my computer will take off again, which I may be in trouble, I don't know. I'm never in too much trouble. Uh, it should be coming up. Do you want to get well? Well, if you hang out with Jesus, there's no telling how you could get well, mentally, emotionally, physically. Uh, he might help you in many different ways get well. Do you want to get well? Could I, could I say that in another way? Are you tired of status quo? Let me say it in another way. Are you willing to change? Did you know that's a lot harder do, uh, to do than, than to say? Oh, yeah, I'm willing to change. You know, God has ways of changing you. Have you noticed it? You can have everything together today, and tomorrow the whole world could be going to pot. You know what I mean? And that's not smoking pot. That's going to, you know. I mean, if, if you are not careful, the whole world can just sweep you and discourage you and make you feel hopeless. Today, in chapter 5, Jesus is reaching out, and he's going to heal a man. And as he reaches out and heals this man, hostility begins to grow. And because of the miracles that Jesus did, which was kindness to people, think about this, they killed him. See, whenever you want to reach out and start really caring about people, sometimes persecution will begin. It's not as easy as you think. So I'm going to take you to the sheep gate, which was a pool with five porticos. This totally vanished. Nobody knew where it was until about 20 years ago, and they found it. It had filled in with trash and dirt. It had totally been covered up. When they began to dig down, they found it. And now you could go to, go to Jerusalem, and there you could go to where we're talking about today, the Sheep Gate, which is called, in, in the Scripture, it's called, <clears throat> down a little bit there, Bethesda. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Arabic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored, covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. That is that verse, verse 4, is only found in the King James. They took that out in all the other translations. Actually, it was basically superstition. We don't know of any proof that anybody was ever healed because of the troubling of this water. They actually took that out. One who was there had been an invalid for how many years? 38 years. I mean, can you imagine being an invalid and having an identity 
that said, I am an invalid, and you've been hearing that come through your ears for 38 years. Then a voice says to you, do you want to get well? I mean, it's like, who is that? This person, which heard this voice, would have had no par a paradigm that would have helped him do this. His paradigms were, were not that way. He, he could only see one paradigm, and you know what it was? About a two-by-six mat and some hope. And he had heard that all of his life. Many of you, I know I went through a period in my life when identity was such an important thing, and all of a sudden, uh, the Nazarene movement was ripped out of my life, literally. And I am out here in the world... And uh, I'm a minister. I went to college to be a minister. I was trained to be a minister. I had no education. Basically, I had a, a Bachelor of Science, but it's only in, in, uh, in the biblical, uh, in, in, in biblical studies. And so it's like, uh, wow. You know, I graduated from a public school, so I didn't know how to add and subtract. And <laughs> phonics, you know I didn't find out about that during public school, but... I mean, it, here I was, and all of a sudden, see, we went through almost seven years of God ripping out my identity. <laughs> I was a preacher. Come on, man, that's all I know how to do. I'm a preacher. I make my living reading books and sharing stories and preaching truth and loving people, and I mean, that's good, but when you need to make money, they don't pay you much for that, I found. And so all of a sudden, my identity was ripped out all of a sudden Diane and I found ourselves not knowing who we were or what we were to be doing now this man had one identity and that was he was an invalid and he wanted to get well but no one would help him now before I go on in this let me give you a story that's out of this book grave robber and I, I think I'm saying the last name right dot zig d-a-n-t dot zig he was enrolled in a graduate, as a graduate student at the University of California, which was Berkeley, studying statistics under a Polish-born professor named Newman. At the beginning of one of the class sessions, Newman chalked two examples of famously unsolved problems on the blackboard. George happened to arrive late to the class that day missing the disclaimer he mistakenly thought the unsolvable problems were the homework assignment so he transcribed them into his notebook and went home and went to work it took a little longer than he anticipated but george solved both of those unsolvable problems on a sunday morning six weeks later an ecstatic Dr. Newman knocked on George's front door to share the news. A bewildered George, began, he began to apologize, saying, I'm sorry, I turned it in a little late. I thought it, I could do it quickly, but I, I, I missed, I didn't get it to you as quick. I, I'm sorry I was late on my assignment. And, and, the, and the doctor said, uh, George, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to tell you that you solve two unsolvable problems. Well, I don't know if you know anything about him. I didn't know anything about him, but he's uh, actually a mathematical programming society established uh, the George B. Dotzig Award in 1982. The tools of Dotzig developed uh, have shaped the way airlines schedule their flights, fleets. Shipping companies deploy their trucks. Oil companies run their refineries. Matter of fact, the list just goes on and on and on of how this person affected our world. But the interesting thing back is that George looks back and says, all of this became possible in my life. But if someone had told me that they were two famous unsolvable problems, I probably wouldn't have even tried to solve them. See, I think we make far too many false assumptions. We look at life so often and say, I'm an invalid. I can't do it. 
It's not going to happen. Well, this little series is to try to get you to think in a bigger way. To th- get you to think, what could I say, out of the box? That's what this is all about, is thinking out of the box. You will never get that if you don't think out of the box. I'm afraid we've accepted too many assumptions that necessarily are not true. That's the secret of experiencing the miraculous. Here's what Jesus said. With God, all things are possible. Well, yeah, I mean, God can do all things. You missed the first word. With God. Who would, have that, who would that have to be? It would have to be the guy by the pool, wouldn't it? It would have to be you and me that go to work every day and live in the mundane things of life and the work. That, that is for you. With God, with God, all things are possible. But just in case you think different and your brain comes at things a little different, he says, let me say it to you in another way. Over in Luke, Jesus says, nothing, whatever you're looking at, whatever you're thinking right now in your mind, he says, nothing is impossible with God. Now, I'll give you a rule of thumb that you can always know is going to be true. God won't answer 100% of the time the prayers you don't pray. I'll tell you, you don't have to guess about that. That is a proven fact. I know that's kind of silly, but the truth of it is, we sometimes come to a place in our life, we actually don't believe it can change or it can happen. We we get locked into that paradigm that sets by the pool or sets at work, and we moan and we groan and we say, nothing's going to change. The invalid's greatest handicap was not his physical body. The greatest handicap he had was his mental false assumption. The assumption was he needed someone to help him into the pool. The assumption was he could only be healed in that pool. And he kept trying to do the same thing he's always done, For 38 years, maybe. We don't know if he was there for 38 years. He had this handicap for 38 years. He could have been at the pool for 38 years. And for 38 years, he was trying to get into that pool, and it wasn't working. And what is is that slogan or that statement? If you keep doing the same thing you're doing, you're going to end up getting the same results you've been always getting. See, that's really what God sometimes wants to do. He wanted to shake me out of my paradigm of pastor and help me to see there was something much bigger than being a preacher in life. That there were miracles out there waiting for me to be a part of. But sometimes our mind has to, the scripture says, your mind has to be renewed. And that, I don't know about you, but that's not an easy thing to do. You know how I, I quit eating sugar, procrastination. (laughs) I failed this morning. I ate a donut. I didn't procrastinate. See, when I'm at somebody's house and they have this beautiful cobbler with ice cream they're putting on it, and I watch everybody, they say, Villard, you want some? And I say, well, I'm going to wait a little bit. Because at that moment, I am dying for that ice cream and that cobbler. Now, this is my secret. Don't share it. And a little bit later, they'll say, you want some now? I'll say, well, you know, I'm going to wait just a little bit longer. You know, I, I just like to put it off a little while, and I'm going to eat some later, maybe. And so a little bit later, they're, they're clearing the table off. And they say, you want some? Last chance. I say, well, I'm going to wait a little later, maybe before I go or something. Well, see, what is happening is I'm building up strength. What's happening, I'm trying not to eat that apple cobbler because it gives me a huge down because I have high... Uh, high blood sugar problems and it'll just, I'll crash see but but the truth of it is I never think about saying God would you heal me of this because I like eating cobbler somehow I don't think I deserve that see the problem is in my mind I have have a false assumption of what God wants me to do maybe 
Now, let me just go a little further. There was a group of Olympic girls, and uh, their teacher was a lady. And two years out from the Olympics, she gave them a video which she had put together that showed the best team that they thought they were going to face at the Olympics. It showed them in competition because they would go to these practices. She put that together, and every day, guess what? These girls had to watch that video two times a day for a week, for a month, two years. Two times a day, every day for two years. Now, by the time they got to the competition, they had already won. Many times the battle starts up here. That's why Jesus said you must renew your mind. You must start looking at those points right there and say, with God, all things are possible. Okay, what I'm doing today, I cannot take the assumption nothing could change in this assumption. That's why I gave you the brick. I'll tell you later what it's about. How many uses do you see for that brick? Can you think of different uses? Oh, if you're conventional, you're thinking, well, we could build a house with that. But if you're not so conventional, you might say, I could throw that through a window. I'm actually challenging you to be a little unconventional. Matter of fact, this will really bug some of you. I'm actually asking you to break the rules. Now, some of you are going to love that. Actually, I kind of like breaking rules. Matter of fact, I found Jesus likes breaking rules. Matter of fact, he did it a quite a bit, and I think he did it for one reason, just to make them mad. Hey, I can't tell you that for sure. But notice, 5-7. Sir, the invalid replied. Sir, the invalid replied, talking to Jesus. I have no one to help me into the pool. What did he just do? He passed the buck. And now he's blaming the people around him for the condition he's in. If people really love me, they would help me into the pool. That's another rule. Take responsibility for where you're at and what's happening in your life and what's going on in your life because you're the only thing you can change. You can't change your neighbor. You can't make them help you get you in the pool, right? That's what Jesus is telling us here. I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying, hey, I'm trying to get there, and this dirt bag steps in front of me. I didn't put that in there, but I think it's close, don't you? Someone else goes down ahead of me, and I can't get in. I don't know if you know it, but every one of us read the same scripture together. All things are possible. Nothing is impossible. Who is that for? Your neighbor? That's going to help you obey it? No, that's for you to start believing. Jesus set an example for us that was so far beyond what we could do. You know why? Only God can do miracles. Only God can do miracles. See, no one but a Christian can read that and say, yes, all things are possible. Only Jesus can help you do a miracle. There is no one else that can do it. And so the Jew Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. I missed something. I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Well, I'm trying to get in and I'm missing a verse here. I thought maybe it's somewhere later on that I missed, but it's just literally not there. I can't believe I ever make a mistake. It's the only one I've made this week. Let me read it to you, verse 8 and 9. Then Jesus said to him, the most wonderful scripture in here is probably later on. I got it switched or something. That's why you should always double check things. Then Jesus said to him, get up. Can you imagine 38 years lying in the same position and somebody says, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. You know what I hear him saying right there? I'm not going to even give you a hand. <laughs> get up. And I want you to pick up your mat. I want you to eliminate this spot and don't have anybody save it for you tomorrow. Don't ever come back to this spot again. Pick up your mat and go home. And by the way, sell it in the garage sale. Or give it away. Or burn the stinking thing. You see what he's saying? He's saying, you do not have to come back to this spot in your life. All things are possible. Now, I don't know if you know, but learning how to walk is not an easy thing. 
It's funny now. Every time I sit down, I feel like I have to learn to walk when I get up now. But I've been watching all these babies. By the way, we got another one on the way. Now, have you watched them? These babies are incredibly funny to watch. They wobble. I mean, we've got three of them in a meeting back there. I was in the other day. And you know that they're not even walking yet. But here's some of the others that are, and they're wobbly. You see them? They can't stand up. They try to stand up. Just standing seems to be a job for them, you know? And then they take off walking, and they fall down. And even after they learn to walk, they look like they're trying to catch their set, don't they? It's like their head's out here, and they're, they're just running real fast to catch up with their head. Did you know it's a proven fact that when, when, you, when you learn to walk, it's an incredible event. Sensors all through your muscles, the nerves, all of them are sending all of this data to your head. Your ears are trying to level everything out and make you able to hang in there and get there. All of your muscles are learning how to adjust, and there's a, hundreds and hundreds of adjustments are being made all the time just like that, and it's just a walk. If you read that book, he actually takes you into some of the scientific data of that. And I, I read that and I was thinking, wow, wow. Here, Jesus said, get up. Within two or three seconds time, a man is learning how to walk. And not only is learning how to walk, all of that data and all of those nerves and all of the repairs are being done within a second. And what is Jesus saying? Get up and walk. But I, I never have walked, Jesus. <laughs> I think that's why Jesus said it in such a commanding way. He didn't give him time to think about it. He didn't give him time. I don't know how fast that all happened here. It just says he, he at once the man was cured. I don't know how fast at once is except at once. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which he took the day on which this took place, here's circle that word, Sabbath. See, I believe Jesus could have done that any other day of the week, too. See, I want to talk to you, a generation, if you're 40 and under, I want you to think about this. This is a very important message for you that are younger. You know, I have known of a day in my life when I saw the power of God moving, and I'm going to come to this in a few minutes, because I'm really wanting you that are 40 and under to realize What's going to happen in the next generation is a, is a group of people that are 40 and under that have experienced God. See, it was in my 35s and 40 that I experienced God in a way that changed my life. It brought me to this point in my life. I believed in the impossible. I believed that when I touched people, they could be set free from bondage. I literally didn't have any assumption that it was not going to happen when I touched people. But over the years, you know what happens? The pool kind of fills in. And we begin just live life as a routine. Now, I know Kurt, he goes and exercises. How many days a week do you go exercise, Kurt? Five days a week. Do you do the same routine every day? No, he does different routines because you know what? Actually, the truth of it is your muscles start adapting. And they stop growing. So you have to do something different. You can't just do a routine, but a routine is good, isn't it? He has to get up every, you know, if he, he gets out of that routine, it messes up the week, doesn't it? Yeah. And then all of a sudden you skip one day and you skip two days and you skip four days and then you're like me. You don't show up for any of them. But I paid a lot of money to work out areas. I give them my $40 a month even though I wasn't coming and I thought it was going to help, but it never did. But if anybody asked me, I'd say, yeah, I'm a member over there. And I was there two or three months ago. See, the truth of it is, in your spiritual life, it's the same thing. We need routine, don't we? We need to get up, and we need to pray, and we need to have time with God, and we need to think about Him. But did you know, in the spiritual realm, routine can become routine. And all of a sudden, you're getting up, and you're, get, you're doing It's just like getting up, going to work, coming home, eating. You know, it's just a routine. Nothing wrong with routines, except routines can become boring. Your spiritual life can move into a slump. 
I entered this not too many years ago. I began to realize that my devotions were boring. I began to realize that, hey, I am kind of in a slump spiritually. I've got to do something different. So I started doing it different times of the day. I started doing it in different ways. I started praying in different ways. I, because, see, my spiritual life was in a slump. It always gets that way because routine becomes routine. Nothing wrong with routine unless it becomes routine. See, sometimes I think we need to go volunteer at the nursing home and pray for people. Just do it once a month or something. Just skip Sunday morning. My sermons aren't that great. And just go down there and pray for people at the rest home. I guarantee you it'll change your life. Maybe you go with Anna and go to Houston and walk the streets of Houston. I found it one of the most life-changing events I've ever done. I need to do it again. Just dealing with people that were living in a hopeless situation. Just praying with them and encouraging them. I couldn't find enough inside of me. I had to go to God for the impossible. Because those people were in impossible situations. What about picking up a different translation of the Bible and start reading it? Yeah, you won't have any of your old notes, so you can start reading the Bible instead of your notes. What about a 10-day fruit and vegetable fast? <laughs> now, that's a good one, isn't it? I gave you fruits and vegetables. That's what Daniel did, by the way, and it, it affected his whole life. See, these are small changes, but routine can be broken if we'll do something small sometimes in our spiritual lives. See, what Jesus says to do is what man cannot do. See, he's wanting us to do things, and so sometimes we have to shake our life a little bit up so that we can actually get there. And whenever God tells you to do something or wants you to, wants you to do something, he will have you to do things that will cause you to have to believe. It will cause you to have to strain. It will cause you to have to stretch because he's causing you to look at something that may look like impossible. Take up your bed. Do not take provisions or go back to this spot, but pick up your bed and walk. Cut off all possibilities of going back. Do everything you can to separate yourself from that negative thinking. I know, I'm sounding like Joel Osteen, aren't I? Aren't you excited? See, no positive thinking is good sometimes. All things are possible, right? All things are possible. Lose that old identity you have in Christ. You're looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You know, he started a work in your life years ago. You remember how great it was. I can remember when I was, I was out there and, and, in Signs and Wonders. I think it's called 501. Signs and Wonders. And, and when they prayed for me, the Spirit of God so touched me and so overwhelmed me that I came home, and I can't, I'll never forget, I looked at Jeanette, and I said to her, you know, I want to pray for you, and I put my hand on her, and she fell down. Scared me to death. And she began to shake, and she got set free from bondages. I prayed for my cousin. I... I had no, my assumption was that when I prayed for people, that power that was in me, I just believed with all of my heart it was going to touch people. Am I still doing that? No, not very much. It's become routine. Study for Sunday, come to church, do your thing, go eat Sunday lunch, go through another day, go to work, go home, come back the next day, go to work, come home, do the same thing. It's, it's, it becomes a routine. But Jesus... When he said to this man, take up your mat and walk, he was going to offend the whole Jewish world. Because in that day, it was illegal to carry your mat on Sunday. Isn't that incredible? And, and, and I believe with all of my heart, he wanted to offend the Pharisees. And listen to me, with all my heart here, with all kindness, you generation that are 40 and younger, you're going to offend my generation if you go with God. You are. Because you do it different. You're going to see it different. You're going to say it different. I mean, you know, you use words that offend me. Well, that sucks. Well, I just got screwed. Well, I'll tell you, when I grew up, those words were not nice words. You will offend us. 
you must go forth and communicate in your language and say because that is your language and you're going to have to do it your way but if you worry about offending us old folks the kingdom of god is going to stop right here i'm not saying it's necessarily words but it's going to have to be you begin to forget about offending people because god wants to take you right where you are with the words that you communicate and he wants to pick you up and say i want you to do all things see we'll get tied up i i'll tell you People would rather have me say correct words than heal people. People will come near leaving a church over an incorrect word or way I say something than they will if I don't heal people. If I started healing people, they would probably get embarrassed or something because they fell down and, you know, a demon came and showed himself. I mean, you know, have you ever seen one of those things? They're ugly. I have been there. See, when Jesus talked about demons, those things were actually real. Now, we've cut, we put nice clothes on them today, and we try to make them look pretty. I hate to tell you, probably some of you got one right now, but I mean, I'm not going to pick on you, but uh, your wife kind of thinks that every once in a while. You know, when you lose it, and you start, you know, using words that I, you know. Anyway, uh, I think with all of my heart, with all of my heart, when Jesus did this miracle, he could have done it any day of the week, but he did it on Saturday because he wanted to rile up the religious establishment. And I think that's why he did it. Now, take this with a grain of salt. I actually believe he enjoyed doing it. I actually believe he enjoyed riling up the religious establishment. And if the church of Jesus Christ isn't shook, and if you are so comfortable you can come to church every Sunday, how many of you invited somebody to church today? How many of you said anything to anybody about God or Jesus or the kingdom? How many of you did anything this week that would have promoted the love of Jesus and the power of God and the kingdom of God? I'm just saying, you know, we can go through a whole week and do nothing for God except go to work, come home, eat lunch, eat supper, you know, have rest, get up in the morning, you know, read the newspaper or, or listen to the news. and take. We can do that all week long and God doesn't even need to come anywhere near it. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to say we have to be shaken up because we get in routines. And I think Jesus intentionally offended the Pharisee because he was tired of this religiousness that said you can't even carry your mat. Listen, they missed the whole miracle, didn't they? They didn't even say that. They just said, who healed you and who told you you can carry that mat? The guy said, well, I don't know, man. I don't I gotta have to go check it out. And he found Jesus, came back and told him. The Pharisees couldn't see past their human traditions and their man-made rules. They could not see the most important or the important. They couldn't see what was most important. And that's exactly what keeps us from experiencing the miraculous. We satisfy with important stuff. We're satisfied with some of this stuff that, yes, is important. I'm glad you didn't lie. I'm glad you didn't steal. I'm glad you didn't kill somebody this week. But, heck, we got to do more than that. Does that make sense? To experience the miraculous, I believe with all of my heart, we have to change our beliefs. Joshua needed some more time. His assumption could have been, God does not stop the sun from moving or the earth from turning he didn't probably i don't know if he knew for sure what was happening he didn't assume that god couldn't stop the sun he just said god stop the sun i've got to win this battle and guess what his assumption was right god can stop the sun he must have read that scripture that all things were possible and he needed some help and he just prayed and god did it elisha they lost their axe head and he come up and said float I guess if he'd assumed that axe heads don't float, he'd have never asked it to float, but he just assumed that God said axe heads could float. What about Mary? Mary, you're going to be pregnant. No, I'm not. See, if she would have had the assumption that you got to be married to have a baby, I don't know if we need to go any farther with this or not. But it changed our life. Because she believed. Peter stepped out of the boat, didn't he? Peter, 
when you step in water, you sink. Now, Jesus said, come. And so he assumed if Jesus said, come, Jesus would help him come. I don't know if he knew how he was going to get there, but Peter, come. And I'm glad Jesus didn't believe that death was the end. I'm glad that he believed that he could conquer death, hell, and the grave. And I stand before you as a person that wants to be a divergent type thinker. Now, a convergent type thinker, what do you think a convergent thinker is? That's when you get down to this brick. You've got to change your thinking. You've got to change your mind. You've got to renew your thinking. See, a convergent thinker is somebody that whittles it away. It just one little bit at a time. He's going to lose weight by, you know, just somehow willpower and, and, and stop eating a little of this and that. But a divergent thinker, he sees more conceptual. He gets a, a new, a, a whole new image of what's going to happen. He begins to see more. And all of a sudden, he has many other ideas about a brick. See, they give this, this test to people that are beginning to want to work in jobs and, and even school. T- they give this test. It's called the brick test. It may not be such a hard test, but it helps, it helps them see who these people are. And see, conven- if they're just regular conventional type thinking people, which is nothing wrong with that. But they know they don't want to put this person over here because he doesn't come up with new ideas. Put this person over here because they come up with new ideas. See, this person that is a divergent thinker will take a pad and he'll think, okay, uses of a brick. And I mean, he'll begin to list and that paper right there that you only have any written down because you didn't do it like I told you to. And if you had have done it, you'd probably thought, I don't think one, I'd build a house and I'd see we have some in the sidewalk and, and, and I guess you could use it to drop it on your toe or something, you know. Listen, a divergent thinker has got 20 things written on that sheet. Matter of fact, that's how I'm trained to solve problems is to get, them a, get a, a pad and pencil. And when you have a problem, list every problem. You know how you do it? You say, God, I need to know some way to solve this problem. It's too big for me. And so I begin to take a pad and I begin to pray and I begin to write. Okay, there's one. Oh, there's another idea. And there's another idea. And there's another idea. And before you know it, they say, don't stop at nine. Go to 20. Stretch that brain. And guess what? It can change things because God will come and help you. The potential in a divergent thinker will come up with many things. This person, this right here on the back, he'll find a way to connect all those dots. How many of you found a way to connect all the dots? Anybody? Yeah, we got those four, five, six, seven, eight. You know how to do it? I'm not going to tell you. Well, matter of fact, I think I do have a picture of this. There it is. Oh, I got to to fix it. Actually, notice what has to happen. You have to go out of the box. You can't make all those, touch all those going in the box. You have to go out of the box. And you will not get one word of my sermon if you're going to go home and think in the box. You think, well, I've already read the scripture. I already know all those things. Hey, I'm 66. And I'm finding things out in the scripture that I never saw before. There are life-changing moments in my life that I believe God is you. What what is he showing me? There is potential in your life that you can't see without God's help. You know what we call this? It goes by another name when it's anointed by the Spirit. What I'm telling you about this morning, when I think about divergent thinking, I'm telling you about faith. That's what I'm telling you about. I'm telling you about a faith that God can do all things. See, as children, we grow up. When we're a child, we ask 125 probing questions a day. But by the time we get grown up, we're only asking six probing questions a day. We lost 119 questions per day by the time we get grown. Because we're not asking them anymore. We're not asking those questions. Like here in the church. Why didn't I talk to somebody about Jesus today? Why didn't I reach out and help somebody today that maybe could have made a difference in their whole life? Why didn't I? Why didn't I just say something kind to somebody today? In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, it says, Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. You can know Jesus. 
and you can think you know enough. But in the truth, when you think you know everything about God or everything about being a Christian, you're actually committing one of the highest levels, what I call excessive pride. Because when, when you meet Jesus Christ, when you become a Christian, it opens a world that you cannot ever, ever fully understand. It is so big. It is so big. All of a sudden, you feel so little. Because after you meet Christ, you realize it's infinite. Really, we should never be saying the word. We should never say the word with our kids. We really shouldn't. I can't. I can't do that. We should be saying, I don't understand. We should be saying words like, I don't fully understand. I need to know more. That should come out of our mouth on a regular basis. I don't understand. I need to study more. But we shouldn't be saying I can't because the scripture says there's nothing impossible. See, what God is actually doing in our lives today and every day of our life is trying to uninstall the Old Testament assumptions. And he's trying to bring in the New Testament assumptions. See, when he said go the extra mile, listen to that statement. When he said, turn the other cheek, he was not giving you some behavioral modification in your life. He was giving you reverse engineering, the old rules and installing new ones in your life. He's giving you rules that you can only do with the power and help of Jesus Christ in your life. And I'm here to give you today a person that is predictably unpredictable. If you're going to follow Jesus, I can predict he is going to be unpredictable. He will do things you never thought he would do. He will want to challenge you to do things you can never think about doing. Because why? He's God. And he loves to show up and just surprise the heck out of us. He loves to see us in situations that we don't know which way to turn. Come in and give us an answer. Isn't that the way life ought to be? Shouldn't life not be such a routine? Shouldn't life have some, some challenges? Who is this person? Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? Who is it that said you could do this? Who is it that came and gave you such a crazy idea? The man found out that it was Jesus. Found him at the temple. And Jesus said to the man, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. I close with this thought. There is a responsibility in following Jesus Christ. There is a responsibility. We must realize if there's sin in our life, he can also help us get free from that sin. If you have not, 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 not met Jesus, you could actually get saved literally today. Did you know you could change where you're going to spend eternity today? Within three seconds time, I think it takes about three seconds, you can make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, notice this, my father is always at his work. We thought he rested, didn't we? He did rest from the creation of this earth, but he has never quit doing good. He has ne never quit being kind. He has never quit doing miracles. He upholds the earth every day of the week, every second of the day. He is always out there doing good. And guess what we as Christians ought to be doing? You need to take a Sabbath, but you need to always be doing good. We need to be always out there helping and loving other people. And I close with just that thought. The only way the world will ever know about a God that can change their life is if we will let him change ours. That's the only way they'll know it. If you're in a routine and it's mundane, do something different this week. Challenge yourself to reach out past or do something. You know, I don't know. Walk in and say, good morning, boss. Wow, what happened to him? He must have started drinking early. I mean, if you get happy out there and really get positive, who knows? You need to be a divergent thinker. There's a million ways that God wants to use you this week. Think outside of the box. Think outside of this, this God. They say that he has probably 
probably in the neighborhood, God operates in probably 50 dimensions. That's what some of them are saying now. I mean, we're, we're, all the rules are being broken. You know that, don't you? We can't even trust what our scientists tell us anymore. They say life's the fastest. No, it's not anymore. See, all the rules are kind of being broken because, see, when you go outside the box, you have God. And God is the one that says all things are possible. Why stay in the situation you are? Why not change? Why not be different? Break the routine. I know. I'm going to babble on. Would you stand? If you want to hear his little pamphlet, there's a few of these. And if you'll bring somebody next Sunday, I'll have a book for you. Lord, I love you so much. I am so glad that you somehow got a hold of me. Lord, I owe so much to you. I just, it just breaks my heart to think that anybody doesn't know you. And yet I say so little. I do so little. Lord, would you just come upon us and bubble over and just get all over everybody? Just let it be like honey that just, we just pour it out on people this week and it just gets sticky out there. Lord, we just need your help. Lord, I don't know. There may be that person. We've got some people being baptized next Sunday. And guess what, Lord? If, if there's somebody here that gets saved today, we could baptize them next Sunday. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, help them to break the routine of just coming to church and going home. Help them to break the routine of just every once in a while thinking about getting saved. Help them just to break it right now and hear Jesus say, come to me. Come to me. I can make everything new. I can forgive you of your sins. I can cleanse you. I can, I can wash away all the dirt and make you new. Come, accept me. And we'll give you the praise. We're just going to give you the praise, Jesus. If you need to, for prayer, please, please come up. Ask Don and Joan, and I see Kurt's here. If he didn't have to go, you might hang it around here. Diane and I will be on this side. And if, if you are, you, you know some of our prayer teams, if you could just.